Okay. We are here for a tour of Mark Henson's exhibition at, yep, we're live. Oh, good. At the Maracuya Gallery in San Francisco. And this is the final chance that we all have to get Mark live with his work at this epic moment of, um, wow, a, life, a lifetime of work that you're gonna share with us. And some of us have had the chance to be there in person, but for everybody tuning in, this is a chance for you to be here, um, you know, by locate and join us for this little tour. So Mark, thank you so much for um, offering to do this and for being your awesome self and making so much incredible art. You've inspired me so much uh, through many years. Uh, a lot of my work definitely is inspired by you as well, including this piece that's behind me, The Great Wave. I think it speaks to uh, the kind of transformative and uh, quality that art can have and the, and the narrative story of what's the possibility of a future that's a little bit more beautiful. And I think a lot of your work does that, but it shows both sides. So um, yeah, the Mark Henson experience in San Francisco at the Maracuya Gallery. Uh, last night was the closing show. And um, yeah, Mark, take it away. Hi, everybody. So I'm standing outside our space. I'll switch over so we can, I'll show you where we're at and everything and get going. Whoops. Uh-oh. There we go. Get back, touch the wrong button, switch the camera around. So here we are outside the gallery in the lovely streets of San Francisco. Here's our space. You can kind of see it's kind of a hidden away little spot, but we were lucky enough to have this area for about a year and the owner invited me up she called me up Mona Lisa is her name she called me up and said come on down and put all your art in my gallery space we'll just keep it there and we'll we'll do some stuff and so I thought all right well that's a good opportunity and I came and saw the space and it's this beautiful space and there was room enough to put about 30 or so of my pieces which doesn't happen very often so I took the opportunity and we've had our things here and we've had some courses here and we've had a lot of parties and people have come and we actually sold some things. So our little hole in the wall gallery here actually was kind of a success, but our lease is up. So it's time to go. And so this is our last day really of having the door open. And so it's transition time, but this phase is gonna change out. And so today, so last chance to have all my pieces in this beautiful space together. So I'm gonna share them with but you all. This phase is gonna change out and... Oh, that sound was echoing a little. Okay, uh, I hope you all can hear me good. Um, so anyway, this piece is called Winging On. It's right here as we come in the door. And I have a couple of sort of angelic spirit beings flying up into the source. And this is uh, an older piece, 1988, I believe, is when I painted it. And it's been very inspirational. I've had people tell me they decided to not commit suicide after looking at this picture. So it has a certain special magic that um, I'm glad to have been able to bring into the world. And so winging on, so these, these spirit beings are flying up into the light. You can see there's a sort of intelligence here in the light. So walking in the door, we have a few more here. This one is called On Temple Steps. And I was inspired by uh, the Temples of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. I haven't ever been, someday I hope to go, but there's beautiful carvings and it's mostly intact, except for the plants have sort of been taking their liberties. And I uh, thought I'd kind of make a romantic scene out of this because a lot of the sculptures in these temples have erotic sort of themes. 
So I had a lot of fun. I didn't, I used some photo references with this one, which is pretty rare for me, but all the various sculptures and decorations I just made up. So I was having some fun pretending I was maybe an architect of this place. And uh, don't try this at home though. You know, nowadays the government's pretty fierce about people taking naked selfies. So I don't recommend that you actually go there and do this. <laughs> maybe someday. Moving on, come to one. I was inspired by, I guess, my Buddhist tendencies to create a sort of an abstract painting based on colors and light. But when you step back a little bit, you can see that we have a meditating face here. So this one's called Reflection. So we're re reflecting our meditations through a water medium. Moving around the corner, have a little drawing, graphite on paper. This one is called The Drunken Poet's Dream of Liberation. And it's kind of hard to see here, but over on the side, we have our meditating drunken poet. He's in nature and on the other side of the stream, we have a urban kind of city scene and he's, he's finding peace in the world through his meditations. And, uh, dreaming of being liberated from all the confines of the urban space. This one here was actually a, uh, a book cover commission for a book on yoga and Tai Chi that came out a few years ago. And I, he asked me to create a meditating person um, at the confluence of two streams was the request. So this is what I came up with. It has a lot of open space in it and kind of a funny composition because we had to make sure there was room for the book titles and everything. So this is kind of a sweet little piece. By contrast, <laughs> this one is called The Wheel of Fortune. And I wanted to show this character here. He's struggling and striving, running on the treadmill, trying to attain all of these things, the worldly goods, the, the things we're supposed to want in life. So he's struggling to get them and the machine's cranking out money and there's, there's drinks and sex and houses and cars and stuff, the stuff we're supposed to told we want to aspire to. It's mostly bullshit. Well, up here in the corner, I have the two fat cats with their hands on the lever to this machine and they're, they're drinking champagne and smoking cigars and uh, enjoying the fact that they've got this poor guy running his life out, producing these things for him. And here's, here's what the machine is doing. It's grinding up nature to create uh, gold bricks on the conveyor belt here. And then they're coming around as packaged goods at the top layer. And it illustrates when you're, when you're all used up they send you down the tubes to go through the meat grinder and that's it. So wheel of fortune. The next piece is called restoring the future. And I, I, this one, I was actually inspired by reading Chris Dyer's little book, the sunlight chronicles, where he described uh, a summer he spent as a tree planter up in the woods of Canada, where his, one of his first jobs as a young man was to walk around the woods planting trees. And it's a, an essential job that I think is a very good thing. So I, I have our tree planter here. She's putting in some trees. There's a futuristic city in the background. So this is the future. So in the foreground, we have some remnants of a highway and car parts and old tires and stuff. It isn't quite cleaned up yet. But the idea here is that the situation is kind enough and that the humans and nature have figured out how to live together. That a mother ocelot could be off to the side watching the tree plants and going on while, while, while guarding her babies, but in a, with a sense of security. So her, her kittens are playing around while she's watching over everything. And the future is being restored here by our tree planter. Next, we have one called Leap of Faith. 
where I wanted to kind of encapsulate the psychedelic experience. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this picture. Come back, here we are. Whoops, are we there? Yeah, okay, my, my screen is blipping around a little bit. It's hard to tell if I'm here or not. But anyway, I assume we are. So this one is called Leap of Faith. And here at the bottom, we, we come into the world and we experience life. And then we go out from the world. And part of reality is the forces of decay and degeneration and death. And on the other side, we have the forces of life and rebirth and growth. So all of these things are integral to the life experience. So our leap of faith is coming into being that we, we trust that whatever's in store for us in this experience we call life is going to be good and that we're going to make the most of it and, uh, and enjoy whatever happens. Over here, I have a small romantic piece called Clouds and Rain. <clears throat> the, the phrase clouds and rain is a, a, a Chinese uh, phrase that is intends that means they're, they're making love. So here, the clouds and the rain are making love and there's a little lightning going on between them. And then as above, so below, we have a little, little bit of that going on down here under the trees as well. Here's a small drawing for what became a large painting called Snail Logic. And so I, in the, my way of doing things, a lot of times I'll sketch rough sketches in my sketchbook, little thumbnails and stuff. And the ones that appeal to me most, I'll work up a more elaborate sketch like this. And then later on, use that as a basis for my painting. So this became a large painting that's about five by five feet. I don't have it here at the gallery, so we're going to have to look at the drawing today. But this is snail logic. Okay, moving into the next room. We had some nice music last night, some rock and rollers and some piano music. So there's some of the remnants of our party. This one is called Between Worlds, another romantic piece. So our, our couple here is sitting out in the, some sort of a field in the grass, enjoying themselves. And uh, it's between worlds, we, uh, we, there's a dualistic nature, the male and female side of things. So I tried to represent that a little bit in these kind of psychedelic looking parts of the side. aspects of the dualistic nature of things. And then down at the bottom, I put in a little reminder of nature and life in general, a little tiny golden toad. There he is. So this is between the worlds. And up at the top, I have some co cosmic stuff going on up in the astral space. Okay, the next piece. It's called Desert Life. And it's basically some, some rocks in a romantic position. So it, if you stack your rocks up correctly, maybe you could reproduce this in real life. And I was inspired by a trip out to the Grand Canyon, the Museum of Erosion of the, of the whole world. And um, I liked the colors there and I liked the things I saw, but I didn't want to create a scene that looked like so much other of the Southwestern art genre. So just looking down at the ground and seeing the rocks and erosion inspired me to make this piece. And it has a few little reminders of what's going on. A little lizard and some, uh, some peyote buttons, where are they? There they are. Get the camera in the right space. And, uh, some, some old bones, maybe scattered by a coyote. So there's life in the desert, even though it looks like a dry and barren place and the little stream of water is passing between them. Okay, moving on to one of my political pieces. This one is called 
a, a land of the free, home of the brave. And I was inspired to make this piece with the first war in Iraq, which I, I call Bush War One. And what was going on there, I don't know if you all remember, maybe some of you are too young, but the United States decided we were gonna get involved in Middle Eastern wars. And this has been going on now for 30 years and we're still doing the same stuff. But it starts with the fat cats who run everything. And so here's our guy and he's got his toys on top of the desktop, his rockets and his tanks, his stock certificates and maybe a little dangerous drugs and his plenty of money and his cigar and he's, he's running the show and where it all comes from is the energy business. So we have nuclear energy and cars and oil wells, and the stuff that power is made out of. And they use their ability to sway the American public to support all of this. So here's our family of patriots sitting around their TV set watching the, the missiles in this war had TV cameras mounted on the front of the missile. So as they're moving in to blow things up, you could actually watch it on TV live and see the missile, you know, going towards somebody's house or a building or whatever and blowing it up. So here's the American family cheering this on while they're stuffing their faces on junk food and drinking some beer and the, the kids are happily playing with their toys. So the young man's got his G.I. Joe and his gun and the girl's got her Barbie dolls and makeup and stuff. So then you've got a little kitty cat. He's ignoring all of this like he should. And on the other side, so this is kind of a cause and effect idea. On the other side, we have the war itself. So here's the battle going on with bombing and tanks fighting and cities being blown up and as, as we know, in war, the real casualties are the people that had nothing to do with it. So here's our poor civilians and some animals that were covered with oil as the oil was spilled all over the place. So this is the results. Here's the cause. Here's the effect. And I didn't want to hold back here because war is a horrible thing. And, and so I wanted to be kind of as graphic as I could because this is what happens. Okay, on a lighter note, <laughs> I have another one of these kind of stripey ones that I, I call Living Waters. And it's, I, I wanted to experiment a little bit with abstract painting and I, I have a hard time just doing colors and blobs and stuff. So even though I just started out making stripes of color across the canvas with this, Eventually it warped out into something where you could actually see something in there. So very subtly, I have a couple of, a couple are here embracing underneath the waves. These are fun because not everybody sees what's going on with these pieces. This one I've had in a couple of shows where I think the people who organized the show didn't realize what they were getting and were surprised, <coughs> excuse me, once it got on the wall and they saw what they really had. So I've had a lot of fun with this piece, actually. Over here, <coughs> I have a little one, <coughs> excuse me, called Bamboo Forest. And one of the things I like to do with my own personal life is go to luxurious tropical places where there's lots of vegetation and green stuff growing. And so I was kind of fantasizing about one of these magical spots. So here's a person walking through the jungle in a, in a beautiful little lit up glade kind of space and some morpho butterflies down here amongst the uh, leaves and bamboo. They like to hang out by streams so they can drink the water. So I threw some of them in because they're beautiful creatures. The bamboo forest. Over here, I have one of my more well-known pieces. This one is, is called um, New Pioneers. And it's a piece where I wanted to show how what's going on in the world and how we could be living. 
so it's kind of a make up your mind piece. How do we want to be? How do we want to survive? How do we want to live in this world? So on this side, I have a, a, a violent battle going on and cities being destroyed and people shooting at each other and helicopters and airplanes dropping bombs and all the stuff that we think we don't really want in the world, but some people do. If we just look at the news today, we can see there's plenty going on, you know, over in Russia and Africa and all around. There's still plenty of wars where people think this is the thing we should be doing. And, but most of us think otherwise. So here I have a bunch of refugees who are using their feet to walk away from this horrible situation because that's the only way they have to get away. So they are picked up their means of their livelihood, their tools and their instruments and their food and stuff. And they're, they're walking away from this horrible scene and crossing over a ridge to a better life. So in, in the middle of the ridge, this, this one traveler is stopping to have a look where everybody passing by has left their marks for good or for bad as they've been passing by this space. So there's indicators of the various states of consciousness of the people who pass by. And then coming to this side, I tried to create a, 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 an idealized world that we actually could build today if we put our minds and energy to it. So our refugees are coming into this space and they're being welcomed by all of the people of the world sitting around enjoying a nice meal together, having a picnic where everybody's there and welcome. And in our space here, we have some art and music and some places to live. So I kind of designed all this solar powered and energy sustainable type situations here and some commerce where there's canals and waterways, business going on and a kind of a city here where people are living and have, have stuff going on. There's, there's dockyards and factories. And it was really fun trying to imagine a new world and hopefully we could create this instead of just blowing stuff up. And over here, I have a little, inside one of the buildings, I have a little car museum. So there's all the modes of transportation of the old days. And then I have kind of a dance studio at the bottom and a, a maker space at the top. So this is the new pioneers and hopefully it'll inspire us to make up our minds to quit living like this and start living like this. And this piece, my original, this is a gicle here. So it's not quite as vibrant and beautiful as the original. The original piece now resides at Alex Gray's Cosm Museum in New York. So I'm, I'm proud to have my piece there hanging on the wall with one by Amanda and one by Ernst Fuchs. So I'm in good company there at Alex's museum. This one is called Riverine Reverie. And this is a, my theme here was as above, so below and the father sky and mother earth kind of wanted to combine those two thoughts. So here I have kind of a, a, a estuary and there's, there's the sky part the masculine side of things. And here's the watery feminine side of things. And I, I was kind of inspired by a real place down by Santa Cruz where I was living, where the rivers come into the, the Monterey Bay. There's some places that look a little bit like this. And then down here at the bottom, as above, so below, we've got our this nice little rowboat picnic here off in the bushes. This is another one that you may have seen around the internet a bit. People use this one a lot and put memes on it quite a bit. This is Spiral Genesis, where I wanted to uh, explore the origins of life a little bit. So here in the cosmos, the galactic energies are turning into the microorganisms that were the, the, the building blocks of life. And as they go around the spiral here, they evolve and evolve into the higher life forms that we know about over the course of history and tracing the evolution of DNA. So that's the life forms. They, they become what we, what we would call the higher life forms 
turning into animals and more intelligent creatures. Finally, into the humans. And then they're, of course, making love or else all of this would never happen. And what's the future of humanity? What are we going to evolve into? I really don't know. So I left that part. It's spiraling off the page into the mystery. There it is. We'll never know. But it's happening. So this is the spiral genesis. Oh, got walking around the piano. We come to Guardians of the Sacrament, a piece I did that I wanted to show all the medicinal plants and healing plants and the entheos inspiring plants of the world. And so I have a bunch of a bunch of species here. There's 40 or 50 different plants represented. And all of this, of course, is the wisdom of our ancestors. So I have the older wise woman here is teaching her young pupil today about the mushrooms. So she's showing him a nice cubensis. Well, down at the, her tray, she's got five or six other species and all her tools and seed sorting equipment and, uh, and a bunch of other different kinds of plants. There's our lovely cannabis there on the right, some San Pedro and some opium poppies and some morning glories and Brugmansia and all kinds of other stuff. So this was a really fun piece to make. I had the opportunity to spend some time at a botanical garden where I had living examples of a lot of these plants for my models. So these are the guardians of the sacrament, passing on wisdom from the older elders to the youngers, which we have to do with every generation. Okay, this next piece, if I can get a good view of it, because there's a large piano in the way, is called Sharing the Wealth. Here we go. And here I wanted to show some examples of how those who have everything treat those who have nothing. So we have our one percenters of the world who have everything and control everything, and they have all the money and food and power and all the stuff they could possibly want. And they don't know what to do with it. So he, he didn't like the taste of this burger. So he's tossing it out. And on the other side, we have the impoverished side of the world where people have to work hard every day just to scrape by and make a living. And some of the most unfortunate ones have nowhere to live and nothing to eat. And we'll even fight with dogs over every last little scrap. So let me get a little closer for some details. So here's our, here's our rich guy, you know, cruising in his hot little car with his babe and everything. And behind, I've got kind of a Las Vegas-y, Hong Kong-y, I don't know what kind of a, you know, there's all, all the, what the wealthy people do to keep themselves happy. And then over here, I have the other side of the world where we've got our favelas and polluting factories and people struggling to make some business and a lively street scene. That of course, all these people are controlled by the army. So I had to put some of them in there. And there's our poor starving person trying to just get something to eat. She's got to get there first before the dog or the boy do. So she can at least get a little bite out of this bit of food that's coming her way. So this picture is based on some incidents I actually saw happen in real life. And uh, so it rings true, I hope. And uh, I wanted to make a comment about that because how we treat each other is really bad. And the Elon Musks of the world have enough wealth to shoot cars into space while people just outside the door here are living in tents on the street, starving and stealing to survive. So moving from this room into the next, We have another romantic piece called Arboreal Affection. And the light's a little glary, but here we have a scene in the cliffs above the ocean here. And we have a 
pair of trees intertwining and relating to each other. No big theme, but just a pleasant space where nature's loving nature. One of my favorite themes. Here's another one on the same theme called Ravine Rapture. And this one I was inspired by a real place that I visited in Costa Rica, up in the jungles, a waterfall and a ferny canyon with the light just coming through a little bit, a dark and quiet place. There's lots of lush vegetation everywhere. So I put in lots of the plants you might see here and a few of the little animals and critters that inhabit these spaces. The next one is one that just started out as a live painting at a, uh, a visionary art gathering we had in Hawaii, sponsored by this crazy guy named Rio, who actually paid for us all to come over there and play around put on a visionary art show and he rented a fancy hotel so we were all living the high life there in hawaii and live painting and doing our thing and this one is one of the pieces that came out of that experience it was a pretty special time and a lot of our visionary art family were able to go so we got to know each other better and uh, and enjoy the beauties of hawaii but i wanted to show with this one the forces of oppression to one side. So we've got our police and money and violence and guns and fencing, and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, this is a special piece to me because outside this poor guy's jail cell, I paid a little homage to the famous Spanish artist, um, Francisco Goya, with his painting that the 6th of May uh, showing that Napoleon's troops shooting some of the Spanish um, partisans in the city of Madrid, that Francisco Goya perhaps even witnessed this scene, but it, it's a powerful painting that hangs in the Prado Museum in Madrid. And it's one of my favorite pieces of art because it's one of the earliest purely political pieces of art we have, a very powerful painting. So I had a little fun here um, emulating his picture and reproducing it in miniature in my own piece. Over here, we have our artist. He's representing all of us, visionary creators. And this is what we do. We use our powers, our magical powers of creation to overcome the forces of darkness. So like, like the hippies in the 60s, putting the flowers down the barrels of guns. I have this, this painter here. He's using his paintbrush to put some rainbow light down the barrel of the gun. And behind him are the, his powers of creation. So he has some beautiful nature and sunsets, and the ocean waves and lovely flowers and insects and animals and stuff. The, the things that are beautiful in life, he's emanating them out and they're overcoming these forces of darkness. So this is the paintbrush warrior. And that's our job as artists. Our battle is to create beauty out of badness. And so there he is. Another politically inspired piece, The uh, Cost of Freedom. And this, this piece was inspired by uh, last time around when they, we had a set of elections where Donald Trump got elected. Uh, the Democrats had a, a get together to decide who their candidate was gonna be where the Hillary Clinton forces managed to shut down the Bernie Sanders forces. And they, they actually used police to kick everybody out of the room. And so I, it didn't seem quite fair to me. So I thought I would do a little bit of riffing on the idea of what happens in our electoral process. So although we think we have a choice and I think our votes maybe make a difference, maybe that's not the case. Maybe just the powerful and the people that have the force of violence behind them get their way. But anyway, I wanted to explore that idea a little bit. 
So here we have our political candidate. He's up there raising his hands and shouting about whatever he's shouting about. And here's the people with their signs trying to express their feelings about what they would like to see happen. And whether it'll happen or not, who knows? Because behind them, there are the powers that be enforcing their will. So this is our cost of freedom is perhaps actually we don't, the cost is that we have to pay with our lives to the wealthy and powerful. I'm not sure if this is how everything really works, but I want to explore the idea. So this is, this is my, uh, my painting on that theme. Uh, on a more quiet note, this one is called Django's Tree. And this was a commission for a little uh, a musical album cover. My friend Django Gurley is a, uh, a musician in California here, and he wanted to have some artwork for a CD cover. So he commissioned me to make this and what he wanted to express because he's also a, a sustainable agriculture advocate. He wanted to express the energies of plants, how by night their juices flow one way and by day they flow the other. So from the roots to the branches and down again is how plants circulate their energies. So this, he wanted me to show that as part of uh, the uh, theme of his music. So I did that and night and day kind of inspired me to think of different parts of the world. So I put kind of an African scene over here where we've got our, our woman drummer here is off in the fields of Africa playing her drum while I put Django over here playing his guitar in Northern California. So nice little piece about music and plant energy. Moving along, I have one here called Fractured Universe. And because of the lighting, I might not be able to show it very well. But my theme here was that all these different realities are kind of contained in little pieces of broken mirror or broken glass or chunks of crystal. So each one is their own little, their own little world. And there's 50 or 60 of these little things expressing different parts of reality floating in space. I wanted to do something a little Dali-esque, kind of surreal. So I created all these little spaces and had them here. Down at the bottom, since this is sort of a galactic thing, the biggest piece is the galaxy containing a galaxy. So this is the fractured universe fossils, some raindrops, an atomic bomb, some amoebas dividing, reaching for the sun, some mushrooms, lots of fun stuff. And right next door, this one is, is called Lost Horizon. And I, the, my title comes from the movie and book about some characters who are wandering around looking for this lost land of Shangri-La where people live forever and are happy and healthy. So here we have sort of the relics of our modern world on top of the jump pile. We have our explorers climbing to the peak so that through the little bit of the fog and clouds, they can get a glimpse of the Shangri-La, the place they're trying to seek out in their life where they can live in happiness and good health. So off in the distance, we have the city of Shangri-La, beautiful space showing itself through the parting of the clouds, but there's, there's not really any way for them to get there too easily. So we're not sure if they're gonna ever get to their ideal, but this is a picture about us trying to find our ideal space to live. Next to it, we have one called The Dreamer. And she started out as a live painting at one of our moksha parties we had during Art Basel down there in Miami. So we're, several artists were hanging out on the stage. Maybe Alex and Allison were there, I don't remember. But I just kind of, I had no idea what I was gonna paint. Just put my canvas on the easel and started you know, drawing some curves and shapes. And eventually this is what evolved out of it. 
So I've got some lovely critters here, a chatty parrot and a happy chameleon in the bushes, and our dreamer, and she's, she's dreaming away, thinking up whole universes of things and life forms while a wave of consciousness kind of crashes against her. So this is the dreamer. And then next and last, I have one of my oldest pieces. This is called Leela. We'll get back here. Leela, the essence of creation. And the title is based on the Hindu goddess Leela, who is a dancer. And as she dances and moves around, her motion brings into being the world and the universe. And so here she is swirling her hands around in the dance and stuff is emanating out and manifesting into reality. So the story behind this picture is, it's one of the oldest pieces uh, it's from middle seventies. And I wanted to experiment with trying to use oil paint in an airbrush. I had, somebody had given me an airbrush my first time really playing with it. So I, busted out my oil paints and thinned them down with a lot of turpentine and tried to run them through the airbrush and it didn't really work out so well. The fumes were horrible. So I had to set up outdoors and the paint wouldn't dry quick enough. It would run down the surface. So it, it didn't work out so well. So I had to let everything dry out and then finish this using traditional brushes and oil paint medium. And she came out good, but it, it was an experiment that, that didn't work out so well in terms of technique. But I was happy with the result and it, it took me a while to finish her because of having to change and do all this stuff. But there she is, Leela. And I think that's kind of the whole show. About 30 pieces. We've had the wonderful opportunity to hang our work here for a year or so and have some lovely events in the space. Met a lot of nice people through having this happen. And my, my sponsor, Mona Lisa, is a very kind and generous lady, helped make this happen. So I want to give her a big shout out of thanks. So unfortunately- Unfortunately, the show is over and we'll have to recreate this whole thing again some other time at some other space. Okay, I'm going to switch back to me. So if anybody has any questions and wants to chat, we're available. Wow, Mark. You too. Oh, big, just, you too. Big applause. I feel like a stadium is roaring right now. You know, <laughs> this like... Uh, you know, the, the collection of like all the energy of all the people that have seen your work and have been inspired by your work from around the world. Um, oh, and go. I'm a big one. <laughs> and, you know, it's just such a powerful thing to hear you speak about the work as we're looking at it. And there's always something new to see and something to learn. And I, you're just, you've been such a, so brave i feel like in not being in in depicting the dark and also the hope and weaving that together in a way that it is like to see the truth of what is happening what's happening on our planet and humanity's role but then also to see the truth of of what the possibility and that's what really comes through for me. And I just, I put this in the chat a couple of times, but just like some of your paintings have been, are really like embody the mission of the vision train and like why we're here in many ways. So for you to share with us and to be a part of this community and it's, it's just so special. And I'm curious if you, you know, as this closing is happening now, um, it's it, interesting. Uh, yesterday was uh, the ninth day of the ninth month, which is very symbolic of closure. And so today is the 10th, right? Going into like a new era. Um, I'm, I'm curious 
how do you feel with this closing and how, where, what's, what's up next for you? What do you feel inspired by? Well, I don't have any firm plans for future exhibition going on just yet, but I have, uh, I have been in touch with a couple of characters that might provide me with such things. Um, there's a gallery in, the, in Nevada City that uh, last week I went up to talk with those people and we had a pretty nice connection. So I'll probably be doing a little showing with them here in the future. And uh, I'm kind of coming out of a couple of years of some sort of serious health problems, which I'm happy to say are I'm done for now with those. And so they, they were kind of a setback to my creative output. So I'm kind of gearing up to just go in the studio and make stuff for a while. So I'm going to be doing that. And I also have a book project I'm working on of learning the program in design so I can figure out how to put together a, a, a book of my pieces, a collection of hundred or two of my artworks and, uh, and some words about them. So I'm, I'm working on putting that together. It's, I'm about halfway through trying to figure out what I'm doing or at least getting it ready enough to show to the professionals who can then tell me that I have to do it all over again to get it right. But um, so I'm, I'm working on that. And, uh, and I'm hopefully now that my, my health issues are resolved for a while, I'm ho hoping I'll get some time in to travel. I'd like to go um, over to Europe again and visit with, with Liba and the whole visionary family over there, Lawrence and, and, and Florence, and uh, see what they are, and, and Otto Rapp and some of the other characters that uh, we know over there. And uh, I'd, I'd like to go revisit all of them and maybe do some other traveling down in South and Central America. I'd like to renew my Costa Rica connections and go visit all of those folks. So I, I've got some stuff going on. You know, I'm being an older person, uh, you know, I know I'm on limited time, so I don't know how much of everything I'll be able to squeeze in. But I, I have every intention of staying busy and keeping uh, keeping uh, active, making things. And uh, exhibition wise, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what's coming up. I'm you know working on trying to make some things happen, but I don't have any firmed up plans yet. That sounds awesome. I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy that you have the energy and the the flexibility of your body coming back and it seems like a real like exciting time ahead for you yeah I'm, I'm i'm truly i'm truly uh happy to say that modern science has made my life a whole lot less miserable <laughs> in the last couple of years so uh i, I turned 71 so i know that I, that's still a youngster in some people's eyes but I'm feeling it a little bit and uh, try to just keep on keeping on. And uh, hopefully uh, my, my theory is that youthful spirits will overcome um, ancient bodies. <laughs> yeah, you're- I, you, I hear you, you have, brother. <laughs> yeah. Rosie, yeah, well, we're, Rosie. we're all, well, all of us who are on the, on the long haul uh, uh, program we're, we're you know we're in for a lot of adventures here yeah, as as mortality sets in it's kind of something i've been in denial about for most of my life but i no longer so I, you have to face the facts when you, you know your your folks are gone and your grand folks are gone and you're the you're the last generation and you, you, there's there's no denying it and your your body goes through a lot of physical changes that you were hoping would never happen and, and, uh, and so you just have to uh, work with what you got. Rosie had a question um, she wrote in the chat. Rosie, do you wanna speak it out? Oh, sure. And hi, Mark. And Mark, I'm two hi, years Rose. older than you, by the way. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, what? 
I'm two years older than you. I'm the oldest in the room. So you're, oh, still, oh, okay. you're still a baby to me. Okay. All right. Well, just hand me, <laughs> hand me my, hand me my bottle and change my diaper, please. <laughs> but I hear you about the body, you know, aging. And it's like, what? I'm supposed to be like dancing and partying. Do you like my hundred? Okay. No, I was just, you know, you, do, when you, you have so many amazing details in your painting that I love exploring. And I see one of them just like, oh, look at that. Look at that. I was wondering, how much do you plan out and how much just comes in afterwards? Is it like both or is it mostly planned out? It's, I would say it's probably about 70 or 80% planned out. Um, as I, I showed you a couple of my little pencil sketches, those are, they're us I tr usually try to work up all the details in those as much as possible, but my paintings are much larger. So by the time you blow up the drawing to a bigger size, there's plenty of room to throw in other stuff. And also a lot of times once I transcribe the drawing onto a big canvas, there's things I'm not quite happy with. So I'll go back and change them all. I'm a little obsessive about that. If I'm not quite satisfied with something, I'll, I'll retry and retry and redraw and redraw until I find something that I think works. Oh. So there, and I do try to leave a lot of room for improvisation. Ones, ones like this where there's jungle and plants. I have a pretty good idea where things are going to go. But the individual little stuff, I, I just kind of make up as I go as well. And um, I, I like to leave some, really, depends on the piece. Like this one here, uh, it was almost all improvised where I just started painting stripes across the canvas stripes of color and, and, and then these figures suggested themselves. So I, I, you know, they came out later. So it varies a little bit. I, I like the idea of just, um, you know, people that don't have a clue what they're doing and just start throwing paint at it and come out with something amazing. I kind of admire those people, but I, my OCD sets in and I want to, I want to really, and my analytical brain gets cranking. And so I, I tend to, like focus on the details a bit, maybe too much, and and try to work out all that little, all the little things, but w without being too loose. But uh, I I do try to keep the idea of looseness in mind when I'm working. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love those details. So I'm glad you focus on them. <laughs> They're amazing. Yeah. Do like you have to... Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say. Um... Do you have an, what's your, what would be your advice for, for people starting out that are, um, you know, wanting to put their ideas and visions, you know, bring them out, externalize them um, and explore them on a canvas or in a drawing? What would you, what would be some words of wisdom? Uh, well, when, when, when I was way back when a teenager, uh, this little, spirit came into my consciousness and said, draw the weirdest stuff you can think of. So I, you know, in my adolescent teenage male mind, I was addled with all kinds of thoughts and I started drawing them out as, as imagery and, and I got good responses. You know, I, my, my friends all thought I was nuts. My teachers thought I was crazy and everybody kind of liked them and and I got I got got me a lot of attention so I realized that that was kind of a path I should pursue so pay attention to what you're thinking and the, the weirdest and most bizarre things that you you can think of um, use them for inspiration in making pictures and um, I guess that's the power of imagination so you, you want to stretch your powers of imagination you know, part of being able to turn that into a painting, of course, is is being a careful observer of the things you actually do see in real life. How, you know, how, how does light reflect off a spoon? Or, you know, what does a drop of water look like? Or, you know, how, how are the muscles on a body actually placed? And how light and shadow work? And all the, the powers of observation mixed with those crazy thoughts is going to help give you, I think, your most powerful pieces. And the other thing I would advise is, you know, always try to keep working and it, it don't let, you know, the fact that you have to work an outside job or that you, you know, maybe have a family that you got to pay attention to the kids or whatever. 
you, you still want to keep working no matter what. So I've had people say, well, I don't have a studio space. And I, you know, my suggestion is, well, throw out your bed and use, use your bedroom. But um, it's, it's, you just got to stick to it. Um, you know, part of, I haven't, you know, the parts of my life, I didn't feel like I was being any success at all whatsoever. and Didn't know if things were going to work out and how things were going to happen. But I tried to keep working all the time. And it, the more things you can create and the more, the more you strive and struggle to be yourself and make your creations visible to the world, um, people start paying attention. And after a while, you have a body of work that, that's undeniable. And it's something you can also look back on and, and feel, yeah, I actually was able to do this. And that inspires you to keep going. Uh, our friend Jason, my old old friend, <laughs> we've known each other a long time, came and saw your show. He's here now, and he has a question for you, too. Oh, sure. Yes. So my, my question is um, finding your voice. Um, I, I remember watching, uh, I took your seminar um, at the New Life Expo and oh. uh, with all the posters, which was brilliant. I mean, that was a really really exceptional seminar um but the uh so I, I remember seeing in you showing a lot of some, some inspiration that uh, had really grabbed you um but uh for a lot of younger artists um some some artists i find can get really stuck on discipline of technique and forget about their imagination, forget about the finding the voice within their heart, you know, find, finding their song, so to speak. Um, where, where did you find your song? Well, I was, I was pretty lucky to be born. I, you know, I don't want to like tell everybody they missed the boat or anything, but I, I was born just in time to experience the whole sixties hippie movement you know, cultural revolution, civil rights movement. But, you know, there's a lot of social foment when I was a young person that, that got, I was really excited about all this stuff. And I was close enough to live near enough to one of the epicenters called San Francisco, where I could get myself down there and enjoy some of the cultural upheavals that were going on and see them firsthand. So all of these things, you know, gave me a lot of crazy and wild ideas about how to do stuff but but really it's mostly tuning in to yourself and i think everybody has you know sometimes people ask me well where do you get your ideas from and it's more like well they're they're floating around the atmosphere everywhere we're like swimming in ideas and they're they're, they're cruising around us like fish so how do you when you see a, a a pretty one go by how do you reach out and grab it and hold on to it and the way to do that, of course, is by having a journal or sketchbooks handy or a really good memory so that, you know, when the phone rings, that, that little piece of inspiration that was striking you the moment before doesn't get lost while you're talking on the phone. So the part of it is, is being able to observe what you're thinking and, and keeping track of it and, and, and making notes. Uh, so my sketchbooks are full of all kinds of crazy little doodles that would be meaningless to anybody. But when I see them, I can remember, oh yeah, I was thinking of this. And if it was something that, uh, you know, kind of grows into an idea strong enough to make a painting about, it will. And, and so having some way to, to track your thoughts and your feelings is, is a good way to, to get that. And mostly what you want to do is just be bold. Is you have, like I said, you have your craziest ideas. And of course, we all think, well, if I express that, people are going to think I'm nuts or people are going to like tell me I'm, you know, full of it or, or what the hell were you thinking? Or, you know, I, your art should be burned or how could you possibly paint a picture of that? Or that picture is so horrible. It needs to have lots of little black squares all over the sensitive areas. So you, you have to think past that and just be, be brave enough to, to present what it is, the, is your, your strongest thoughts. How do you want to bring them out and, and share them? And regardless of 
what you worry about people are going to say or do about it and and just see what happens it's 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 kind of fun really you know it's like what can i do to to tweak their little minds or how do i how do i bash somebody in the head with a artistic two by four to to see what happens and, and you know change their mind or how can, how can i just like blow this person's brains out with art and so you you want to try to do that if you can and to me it was always part of the fun was hey everybody look at this thing and they're like oh my god what are you thinking so being unafraid to um do that is is part of i guess what you'd call finding your voice because eventually you, you have a, a body of things that show what you were thinking and there's your voice talking to you yeah when i when i saw your show i mean i've it was, it was beyond fearless. It was beyond um, there, there. Walking into uh, the gallery space, it was really um, it was captivating, and I almost felt like I didn't have enough time for each piece because um, there's there's so much involved. It's not just you know walls of portraits. It's not just walls of you know single images. It's each one of your paintings is full of thousands of images, <laughs> you know, it's, and, and so many parts of it tell, I mean, it, 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 it tells stories and it, and it, and it catches your eye and it, and it, it takes you on a journey. So I was really, um, I was really impressed and um, it was great meeting you and, and Miss Bonte. So. Well, Thank you. I, it's, I, I try to make art where you don't see it all in one look. And whatever whatever that means, um, you know, some paintings you can, the average time a person spends in a museum looking at each piece of art is only a few seconds. So you're, you're in a museum full of great masterpieces and you have a couple hours, there's a couple hundred pieces you walk by and you, you just glance at most of them rather than pay serious attention. And really a lot of the, a lot of the good art in the world, you could spend an hour or two or more just looking at each piece and, and studying it and looking at all the fine details and trying to see the underpainting or if there's a pencil sketch underneath and getting to know how the creator, what they, what they did to make that piece. Um, studying other people's art is a wonderful way to improve your own because if you see how masterful artists and understand how they, they actually went about creating their piece, um, then you can incorporate those things next time you're sitting at the easel. And uh, yeah, I try, I try, well, I, as you all know, I, there's a lot of details and little things I tuck into the corners of my paintings. And one of the reasons uh, I put them there is because I want people to keep looking. So, you know, it's, it's actually more worthwhile to maybe spend an hour looking at one painting than spending an hour looking at a hundred paintings, even though you, you maybe take in all the hundred paintings. Yeah, I looked at all of those, it was great. But maybe the time spent to just really study one, you actually get more out of it. So I, I know I, you know, 30 or 40 pieces here at the gallery, it's a lot to take in. So I, you know, luckily we were here for almost a year. So people had plenty of opportunities to come back a few times and spend a little more time looking. And, um, yeah, I recommend if anybody wants to, that sometimes less is more. Having a few only in an exhibit is maybe better than having, you know, a, a 30 or 40. And so people can actually like, just get to know the one piece. But um, having them all in the same room together is, creates a special world too, which I, I think it, it doesn't happen that often. So I, I like being able to create a space where it, I pervade the whole space with my own um, sense of weirdness. It was, it was definitely magical. I, I really, really was, uh, I felt very privileged to come to the space. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yay, I love this. And, you know, just this appreciation for um, being with the original paintings, you know, and I like your comment a lot, Mark, around going and studying um, other artists' work and going to museums, gallery shows. And I always feel like a kind of like energetic um, shot <laughs> that hits me after I go to a museum and, um, 
get humbled in many ways. And sometimes I get riled up because, you know, it's something I want to yeah, riled up because I feel agitated by what I've seen or because I'm, I'm feeling inspired, but more than ever, it's like, it's a jolt. And so I think it's like so good to, to see other, to go and view other work. And another thing I wanted to say about your work, Mark, and what I feel is um, a big point around this question of finding your voice too, is around the mission, like the mission of, of the work. Like what is your intention behind it? And um, what are you trying to say? And I think a lot of Mark, your work has that. And I, I think that that kind of uh, art is really, really valuable. Um, not all of, not all art has, um, I guess, like a strong mission or intention behind it. But I feel most attracted to that. And I think it has like a kind of, um, it can be quite open to like how somebody wants to um, interpret it. Everybody is going to interpret it in their own way, but that mission is what carries the work even further. I, I would say I have a couple of missions. Um, one of them is to, you know, bring some beauty into the world. Um, one of them is to, with my romantic pieces, I want to, I want to foster a sense of love rather than, you know, a lot of, you know, there's pornography and, and the sexes oppress each other or the battle of the sexes or something. I, I would rather see all those things being harmonized and beautiful. So I, I want to bring out the beauty of human relationships and, and the, the, the marvel and wonder of all of that. It's amazing. Luckily I've, you know, had a few, partners in life that showed me some special spiritual things that um, made my life more complete. And I think a lot of the struggle and strife in life is people are trying to find that within themselves and perhaps with a partner and, and how, how I want to foster that to happen so that we have a, a more peaceful and harmonic world. I see a lot of um, injustice and bad stuff going on in the world, how, how people treat each other and, and, and with, you know, with, with greed and violence and stuff that I think a lot of it's frustrated creativity. And I would like to somehow foster some changes in our, our psyche and in our consciousness. And one of the ways that happens, is, you know, our, our time here is limited. So if you can leave something behind that continues to function to do those things, um, that's a good thing, I think. And, and paintings, you know, they stick around. If people take care of them and they're nice, um, people will take care of them and they, they continue to emanate their magic forces for centuries. And so hopefully uh, a few of my pieces maybe have that kind of power. We'll, we'll see. I won't be around to see it, but, but maybe, maybe history will be kind to some of my work and they'll continue to cast magic spells down through time. So, so uh, we, you know, creating some cultural change. How do you want to, I mean, I know, I guess it's a big thing or maybe it's egotistical to think one actually has the ability to do that. But I, I really do believe in that. And that, uh, that by our, our mission of art is to expand human consciousness and to um, foster our evolution into a, a higher form of being than we are right now. And so that's, that's the main thrust of my efforts is to, in my own small way, uh, make those things happen. Choo -choo. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that sums up, you know, in many ways, the, the attractor um, that has brought us to the train, you know, is uh, seeing art as that tool and uh, medium to help show another way. And you mentioned Alchemize, um, this gathering that happened in Hawaii and about over, a little bit over a decade ago that I had the opportunity to go to and connect with so many of the visionary art family. And um, 
it was Jim Shannon who came to the second one. He was the, the general of the new earth army. Um, and uh, there was a movie, the men who stare at goats that was uh, made about him. Um, and he said, he said, it's the artists that are painting the signposts for the future. And I have heard this in multiple podcasts lately and books that I've read. And it's like the artists that are at the forefront in many ways, um, pulling out of the ether ethers, pulling out of the visionary realms, the potential visions of where we could go um, and what we, you know, what it could look like and what it could feel like and helping, helping um, seed that. So I see like the paintings, you know, like you, you make prints and stickers and posters and like, like many of us do. Um, so the work, no matter what the price point is, you know, it, anybody could have it for the most part, or even if they have access to the internet, they can screenshot something and it can be the background of their phone. And that's medicine in some ways, you know, there's an energy, like the mission, the energy that you put into that painting, that prayer, then emanates. And I hope, and I sense that there is a ripple happening um, that is because of the art. And to me, if, if I can make work that can do that, I feel fulfilled in a big way as being a part of, um, you know, the, the solution in a sense, like pointing towards a way and being interested in that. Because one thing is just that you have that one painting of um, where it's like the, the visionary world off in the distance and the people climbing on all the piles of rubble to look at off in the distance, um, you know, this potential and will they ever get there? And on one hand, that's, that's an ideal that can maybe be so lofty, it's not even real, but we have to have an aim. We have to have a, a direction that we're interested in and do the little steps of creating that in our world right now. Because if we only live in the future, it's also a total fake. <laughs> uh, it, it's just a made up thing, right? But we can through, you know, through stories and art and through daily practices become more and more like in that direction, right? So that's what I think like the train or this, this making art that has a, a, a momentum and a movement towards a direction that has, um, you know, has the qualities and maybe essence of, of thriving you know, it's, it's making ripples and making that a tractor. Well, we're all, um, as creators, we, we, it's kind of like magic. You know, you swirl your paintbrush around and something appears out of nowhere. And that something that appears has the, the power to influence people's lives and, and, and maybe the lives of humanity in general. So, how are we going to use our magical powers? We have to decide, you know, what, what our purpose, you know, we have the power. So how are we going to use it? What are we going to do with it? You know, we could, we could, you know, cause trouble or we could maybe, you know, bring some beauty and happiness to people. So part of that is deciding how we want to, how we want to focus ourselves on, on what kind of changes we want to make. So we, we all have to decide that for ourselves. But as, as artists, yes, it's true that we, uh, we are creating signposts to the future, um, visualizing the future, visualizing how things could possibly be. And, and not everybody has the ability to, to visualize or think stuff up. So maybe, you know, that inspires them to get going in their, in their own efforts to make, everybody wants to make something better in the world. I think, I think, you know, even the, even the nastiest people that Donald Trump's probably think they're, they're doing something good. Yeah. You, know, you know, it might be a delusion, but they, in their heart of hearts, they probably want to want to do something good that people will remember them kindly for. 
And so how do we foster that in every person, you know, give them the feeling that they've completed their life's mission. And sometimes a, a picture, you know, being worth a thousand words or so can help to make that happen. So, yeah, it would, you know, you just got to keep plugging away at it and, and not give up. And whether, you know, we'll never really know probably how much change and effect will have, but to, to not do anything isn't really an option. You, you got you to make the effort anyhow. Yeah, we definitely need to remind each other to get back up when we're down and it happens all the time, right? But you, you know, depending on the pulls of the moon or the planets or whatever it is, you know, we, we can lose that sight, you know, of, of the value of our, of our gifts and feel like our voices are, um, you know, nobody's listening. And maybe sometimes we don't even know what to say, but I feel like it's, um, it's a big role of the community to uh, take turns and stepping up and um, taking, yeah, taking turns, literally, you know, and, and, and that it's good and important to also go into isolation, to go quiet and gather, gather the seeds again and gather the inspiration and it's the cycle of the seasons. Yeah. Um, anybody else here feel like they want to jump in and have something to share? I love seeing um, Michelle and family screen here, little Zane and the future, um, you know, representing. Yeah, thank you for the tour. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, you're welcome. My mom Thanks enjoyed it as well. Yeah, very nice. Oh, so. thank you. So nice to meet you. And and um, yeah, to feel that and Zane's getting in bound more. Yeah, I'm so happy. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Zane. Thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there anyone else that um, wants to ask any questions or jump in here? I know we've been going for a good hour and a half, so I'm sure uh, we'll be wrapping up here in just a little bit. Um, Raise your hand or unmute, and um, if there is anything. It's nice to see we have such a global community here, and um, we're really like we've got we've got crew tuning in from India, from um, Mexico, from Brazil, from uh, Scotland, and um, Ireland, and all over the U.S. and Argentina in the U.S. Danny Love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I had something to say. Honestly, I I really love the idea of something that you mentioned sort of later in the in the conversation about the you know it's the alchemy of the painting and the imagery carrying on into the future. You know, so that these creations and you know the deeper meanings of the artwork um carry on and have that magic to generations and generations you know as you know someone that's creating their their you know their life's work like you are you know um i really enjoyed that you know that that meaning of the conversation so thank you well, paintings can be like time machines. I know when yeah. I go when I go into the museum and see something hundreds of years old, I, I can travel back in my mind to be perhaps in the studio. Yesterday, we had uh, the pleasure of going to see an exhibit about the Tudors, uh, King King Henry the Eighth and Elizabeth, and the, the Tudor yeah. family who ruled England five hundred years ago. And a couple of the paintings were there by the famous painter Hans Holbein. Picture of, of Henry VIII that you probably see in every art history book or any book about Henry VIII. This is the, the, the picture you often see. And there it was in real life where I could walk up yeah. to it and, and look at it 
somewhat close and personal. They did have some bars and stuff. You couldn't get as close as I would like to really <laughs> try to study the technique. But immediately it was so well, such a beautiful and well done piece of art that I could imagine I was in the same room there standing beside Mr. Holbein, looking at King Henry there in all his fancy clothes, standing there staring at me. That you could, you could not only um, feel the presence of the artist, but you feel the presence of the sitter as well. This powerful, yeah. powerful, fierce king. Here he was, you know, in all his glory or energy or whatever you want to call it. You could sort of like the portraiture power was so was so good that you could actually feel like you're in the room with him better maybe than a photograph even. And and go right back in time to to be there in the presence of these two people. And and it is really a powerful experience. And, uh, right. And it's amazing how much energy is stored in the layers of the paint. You know, there really is more life or, or whatever you might call it in in the paint than than just a, a photograph that was clicked, you know, off, you know, which they didn't have then. But that's that's something I, I've, I've always been fascinated by is the the presence of the painting itself, you know, after especially after lasting for centuries, like what you're talking about. You know, yeah, Holbein was such a master artist that he could capture the the personality of whatever was in front of him so perfectly well and with such such force and clarity it really uh, i would you know if i could even come within a hundredth of his abilities to do that i I'd consider myself a big success <laughs> right I, I was just at the same show um uh, a couple of weeks ago and it, it really is a stunning impressive uh, I've seen all those pictures I've seen all those paintings um, in in books but um, to actually get to see some of Holbein's stuff in person was and it's all behind glass so you can't actually like it, there is that layer of I want to because he, he actually didn't paint very thick I mean he didn't paint in a lot of layers um, he was sort of known for not painting dramatically with heavy, heavy layers um, compared to like Titian or something, you know. So he, um, he, uh, you can really see the underpainting, but just his, his um, simplicity and his elegance is, um, I mean, I think all of us who have seen his work or other people who've been influenced that are also influence of, of ours, um, it translates, you know, into our own work. And I, I see that in your work. So, I mean, I think you've definitely accomplished um, lifetimes of, of, of elegance and, and um, simplicity and, and complexity all at the same time. So that's the, that's the nice thing about seeing your work and, and, and how large it is. And even some of the smaller pieces, the, um, the distance that it goes of telling stories um, where in seeing Holbein's pieces, I mean, he was, he's commissioned by the King and, um, and they're just, they're just still portraits. And I, I find myself similar where I do a lot of still portraits um, and I want to tell stories, but for some reason, that's why I was asking about the voice. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, set off that, uh, that, that little Cambrian explosion within ourself, you know, so to speak. Um, so we have this, because you've definitely set off a Cambrian explosion. You know, the the big bang within you is just, I mean, it's 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 continuously expanding. And that's um, it's very admirable, to say the least. Well, I, I, li I like to hope so. Sometimes when I look at other people's crazy creations, I think I'm, I'm very limited in my creative powers. I don't quite have the, the wildness and breadth of imagination I'd like to have. So I have to fake it. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. you definitely, I mean, if uh, it's great that you still have aspirations, you know, and, and very high aspirations, because I've seen your work in person and it's, it sets a bar, um, a very high, and if that's just a standard um, for you, that's, it's a very high bar for me. So I, I really appreciate what you do. Well, 
don't give up, keep trying, and eventually you'll have a lifetime of beautiful works to look back on. And I want to note, you as the artist will probably never be to satisfied. Oh, Very absolutely. rarely. Ab absolutely not. There's, there's, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm never, I'm never a hundred percent happy with what I've made. And so, you know, it's just like that propels you forward. I remember asking. Yeah, yeah, it, it goes, it goes with, it goes with the job. And, and like, like yesterday, when I go in the museum and see wonderful artwork, I come out of there thinking, oh my God, why do I even bother? I could never possibly even get anywhere close. But then the little itch gets in and you want to go back in the studio and give it a good try and see what happens. And of course, that expands you. Give it your best shot. And, you know, your humble effort is huge. I mean, to actually step beyond that, like, little, that voice of hesitation and doubt is um, what stops so many people, you know, like, and so for you to step beyond that and to actually make a mark and to actually do something, I think it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge hurdle to overcome. You know, and once you get it, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but I have it all the time. Once I get past to actually touching a pencil to paper or a brush to canvas, something starts to happen. And it's like, oh, hey, okay, I'm here. But the hardest part is getting started sometimes with all the distractions of the world and everything, all the self-talk. And then there's some, there's all the angels come to support you and the demons <laughs> <laughs> you need them both <laughs> yeah. joe bob says um uh demons are angels in disguise that will torture you until you leave hell oh perfect yeah i like that i'll go with that <laughs> get the hell out of here yeah okay <laughs> oh so good well shall we wrap it up I think people are, are ready to move on to some other to having lunch or dinner, wherever they're at. Um, yeah. I, I got to hit the highway and head home. So. All right. Well, thanks thank Mark, so much. Um, thanks for having me on the train. Um, I think it's wonderful. We all can get together and support each other in our endeavors to make a better world. So it, everybody be inspired and work hard and uh, share your stuff every chance you get. Yay. She too. Yes. Yes to yes to all of that. Thank you so much. And anybody uh, tuning in, you can go back and watch the recording. It'll be up on uh, Facebook and YouTube. So on the vision train. So come join choo -choo. us sometime. Choo -choo. Choo -choo. All right. Much love, everybody. We'll stop our live stream. Okay. Next Thanks time. For